Hi everybody, welcome. Hope you are pretty warm because it's pretty cold in here. <laughs> so if you need to stand up and stretch out or you know do some kind of exercise, please feel free to do so. And I will maybe ask some of you to come up here and you know do some coding with me so you can get sweaty and you know or stressed out at the same time, which will warm you up. So it will be very good for you for your health. <laughs> Um, so, hi, I'm Jakub. I will be talking about Pester here today. And first of all, thanks for all the sponsors and all the or organizers, because it's really nice to come here to Singapore for this awesome conference. And hopefully it will only grow and we will be able to come here next year and so on. So thank you and thank all the others. Um, there are a few slides where you can uh, look at docs from Microsoft. We were asked to put them in here. So if you want to scan the code and uh, check it out, then please do so. And Microsoft love geeks. OK. <laughs> so this is me. Uh, I'm maintain maintainer of Pester. Currently, I'm probably one of the most active, or maybe the only one. Uh, so you can follow me on Twitter at uh, NoHVND, you can follow Pester on Twitter at PSPester. And uh, if you have any questions, you can uh, get in touch with me on PowerShell Slack, or you can just send me an email, or you can tweet to me, or whatever you want. So you are not alone, we have a big community, and we can connect you with people who can solve your problems. So now the presentation. So this is an introduction to testing with Pester. I will try to take you in 45 minutes through all the basics, show you some basic use cases. And tomorrow I have a second talk where I will be showing some more practical stuff, some more patterns that you can use, and some more stuff over this very, very basics. So in 45 minutes, you should learn the absolute minimum to start. You can learn about mocking. You, can learn about, uh, you will learn about mocking. You will learn about testing basic functions. And that's my goal for today. So first of all, what is Pester? Pester is a testing framework. When you go to our GitHub, you can uh, read that there is something about BDD, which is behavior-driven uh, testing. Well, behavior-driven development, sorry. and. Uh, all of that is not very important for you. What is important is that Power, uh, Pester is a testing framework for PowerShell, and I will show you how to work with it. And first of all, I want to tell you about how I started, because I was, if you never tested with Pester, I was in your shoes five years ago, maybe six years ago. I didn't know PowerShell, first of all. And I got a project that I said, oh yeah, I know PowerShell, that's fine, because I've been to one week like tutorial where they teach me and I thought, yeah, PowerShell easy is just scripting. How difficult can it be? And then I picked up the project and I started coding on it and I did it for a week, two weeks, three weeks and stuff started breaking and then they said, okay, then it has to work on Windows 7 and it has to also work on Windows Vista. And it was all around this power, uh, the power config of Windows, where you have power cfg.exe. But in Vista, it uses GUIDs, and in Windows 7, it uses like a normal command line uh, commands. So I tried to put this together, and it didn't work. And it's very difficult to test stuff like that, because when you want to say, like, this computer should uh, sleep in 45 minutes when it's in this configuration, but then we send it a remote command, and it will tell it, now you are in a maintenance mode, so you never shut down. So how do you test that? It's just very difficult to do. So I looked for a framework to do this testing for me, and I had no idea what unit testing is and no idea what I actually want to do. I just know that, knew that I want to somehow automate the stuff that I do manually. So I looked through all the frameworks that were there at the time and I chose Pester because it had most of the features. And luckily, it sticked and now it's the de facto standard for PowerShell testing, which is really nice. Maybe because of me, probably not. But uh, we kind of revived it, start, I started writing about it, then Dave Wyatt uh, joined the project and people started using it. They Microsoft picked it up to test PowerShell and they started shipping it with Windows, so it was really nice. But if you now don't know anything about Pester, you can catch up. Believe in yourself, and even if you didn't know anything about PowerShell, you can do the same thing. If I did it, you can do it. 
So testing might sound a bit daunting, but it's not. It's very simple, unless you make it difficult for yourself. If you start complicating things, if you start overthinking stuff, then it will get complicated, but it doesn't have to. So there is some theory, there is a lot of books that you can read to get to know stuff, but luckily I already read them so I can sum it up for you. Testing is pretty much, if this, then that. <laughs> so you just say, this is what I want to get, and this is how I test it. And you just give an example, and coming up with examples is easy you write a function that reverses string. Like, that's a really terrible example. If historians in the future look at us, they will be wondering, why did they all code it like reverse of strings over and over and over again? Because this is the example that everybody uses for testing. But it's an ex easy example to come up with. You just say, this is the string, this is how it looks reversed, and now I need to code the stuff that's in the middle. And that's all there is to testing. You just need to come up with ways to give examples of what you want to do. Again, keep it simple, very important. And of course, keep it readable. People say, testing is like documentation for your project. And it's partly true. It should be like documentation for your project because if you cannot read your test, you don't know what's happening and you don't know what your software does. But if it's your only documentation, then you might have to reconsider because not everybody is a developer, not everybody wants to go through hundreds of your tests and connect the dots, figure out what exactly is happening. But if your tests are readable, the better. So, how do you get Pester? How do you install it? Well, you don't have to because on Windows 10 you already have it built in. Because it's one of the open source softwares that ship with Windows 10. Yay, we have like 700 million installations, but nobody uses them. <laughs> so it's better if you update. So you do install module, which is an awesome that connects you directly to PowerShell Gallery. And since Pester is shipped with Windows, you have to also skip publisher check and do force because otherwise it tells you, okay, you're trying to install something that you already have, but it's not, uh, it was uh, signed before and now it's not signed. So you need to do this kind of trick. I'm working uh, to make uh, Pester signed, but uh, I don't have that much time. So if anyone wants to do a full pull uh, first pull request to, uh, to our uh, repository, you can do this, you can make Pester signed through Let's Encrypt, and that would be great. Syntax. So syntax is very simple. It has only five or four words. First of them is should. So should is a so-called assertion, and by that uh, you test, uh, well, you express what you want. So you can say, I want this value to be equal to something. I want this file to exist, or something like that. It's <laughs> nothing uh, complicated, it's just an equal, it's just a condition that has equal operator in it, and if the condition is not successful, it throws an exception. And then the framework picks up that exception and gives you like a red message that says, okay, something failed. So an example of this should would be we have three hashtags, we pipe it into our function that we are testing, and our function should be replacing every, every hashtag with an asterisk or a star. And in the end, what we want to get, if the function works correctly, we want to get three stars. So we just say, this should be this. So if this, then that. Simple like this. Internally, an assertion looks pretty much like this. You give it some expected value, and if the expected value is not equal to the actual value, you throw an exception. If it is equal, then you do nothing. Then we have another keyword, and it's called it. It represents the one test that you are carrying out, the one validation of an example. And so we would take the example that we had before and we wrap it into it and give it some description where we explain what we want to do, what we want this code to do. 
And if we run it, if this uh, assertion is not successful, it will throw an exception, it will catch it, and it will print a red message on the screen. If we wanted to do like a poor man's uh, pester, then this is how it would look like. We would have a try catch block, and if nothing bad happened, no exception occurred, we would write a green message, and if an exception occurred, we would write a red message. If you look to the insides of Pester, this is how it looks like. like. There is a finally block and there is a like empty while loop around this, but this is the main gist. This is the actual mechanism. And then we have describe and context. I personally cannot remember when I used context the last time, but in Pester 4, they are the same function. They just have different name for historical reasons. But we use them to group stuff together. So if you are describing a single function, you can put it into a describe block, and then you put the different it blocks inside of it. What it also does in the background, it is, uh, it's uh, managing your mocks and managing your test drive and so on. But we won't go into much detail right now. Just remember, put it into the describe block. If you don't, it will throw an exception and tell you, no, you have to put this into a describe block. So do it. Again, internally, very simple. We just have a function that's called describe. We have a name that we give to it so we can print it to screen. And then we have a piece of code that's represented by a script block that we just execute and then we pipe or save, uh, discard all the output. So we, in here we assign it to null. You could also do like pipeline out null, something like that, but that's, that's slower, so we are using this. But Internally, it just executes code, and since it is a function, and describe is a function, and should is a function, then this is just like a pure PowerShell, no magic in it. And then we have mock. So mock is something that a lot of people find very uh, daunting. I don't know why, but uh, it's a simple idea. You have a mock, and you have a function that you want to hide. So you want to give it your own implementation. So for example, I have this stop service, and stop service, what it does, it stops a service by name, so, or by some other parameter. So if I did this on a testing system, then I would be changing the actual environment. And if I'm unit testing, I probably don't want to do that. So I will fake out the stop service, and give it no implementation. So yeah, if you are good in PowerShell, then you can see that this won't compile because then the last curly brace is commented out, but never mind. So the body is empty. And uh, if we call stop service at any point, then it just won't do anything, which for us is very useful if we want to create a seam in our code where we can inject or test against. And so if this stop antivirus service uh, internally just has the name hard-coded for the antivirus service and tries to stop it, and if it gets an exception, it tries it again, and then it maybe throws an error. For testing that, we don't need to stop the actual service because that would be difficult. We might not have it even installed. We just want to test that our behavior that we put around it is correct. Okay, makes sense. No? And so internally, again, so we can look at how it works, we have uh, some built-in command like remove item, and then we create a function that we put over the mock. So we shadow it, and this would be the body that you saw there with the comment in it. So here I represent it with nothing. And so if you know how PowerShell resolves commands or functions, it takes in the scope the one that's closest to it. And in here we actually do like a lot of magic, so you can do it in module scopes and so on. But in this simple case, when we call remove item, instead of calling the real one, we call this function because it's closer in the scope. And you can do like fully qualified module calls, but we take care of that as well and so on. So it works, but this is the basic principle. Define something that hides the other thing, and that's it. OK, no magic. Is there, was there any code that you didn't understand? 
No? <laughs> well, you didn't because you don't code. <laughs> so now we will try a few examples and uh, we will try to do it on real life examples, not like writing a calculator or reversing a string, hopefully. So some context first. If you don't know it, then you don't have to understand it. This is a Jenkins. Jenkins is an open source build server, very popular. And we were building some stuff on it and I needed some scripts that would normalize how I do stuff. And we can like output the stuff in the same way throughout the company and so on. So I decided, why not? Let's use PowerShell because I can run PowerShell on this one. So I wanted to write some tasks and this is kind of how it looks like in like from 10,000 miles above. Uh, we have some setup environment in PowerShell, then we had some different task in CMD, and then we have a different task that packaged and published a Docker image. And I will show you like tiny pieces of this workflow that uh, I tested and wrote with Pester, so you can help me with that. So Jenkins has some environment variables. They, the built one, built-in ones look like this, so they have capital letters, underscores, and so on. And uh, then we also chose to use a semantic versioning like this. And what we wanted is to, on every like push to our repository, we do a build and we build something that has like all of this information, like when it happened, from which commit it came, which version it is currently and so on. And then when we were done with this, we wanted to take the same artifact, the same build in thing and uh, for example, publish it as version 1.1.0. But uh, you don't have to know much about that. We will just be building a string like this in our code because I had to customize it like this and I used a tool that gave me the base version. And the tool that I used is Git version, which is an awesome tool for uh, semantic versioning and different kinds of versioning. If you have a repository and you, for example, a tag, a commit with a version, then this tool can look at your repository history and figure out what the next version will be and it can give you uh, different tag, uh, sorry, different strings that include a lot of information about the current version, like when it happened, which commit is coming from and so on. So then in the future, if you embed it in your assemblies or in your scripts, you can see where exactly you took this version from that's deployed on the server for, I don't know, three months and has a bug in it. So then you can track it back look if you fixed it in the meantime, deploy a new version and so on. And the Git version has output that's formatted like JSON and there is a lot of different properties on it, but those are the ones that were important for me. So we have pre-release tag. If we try to release a beta, then we have the SHA of the comet, the full one. And then we had a commit date and I were transforming that into different into different uh, output paths. So task number one, extremely simple, convert a git hash to a short hash. So we will switch to code. Is there anyone brave enough to come here and help me with this example? No? Ah, oh, are you? <laughs> so this is a test that I wrote for it, if it runs, will it run? Yeah, I was just scrolling the other way. So, do we see the output? Yeah, this is the test that we wrote. Here we have the describe. If you look at the top, it says describe get short hash. We can see reflected it in here. And then we have the it that says converts long hash to seven hex digits. I don't even know what I was thinking with seven hex digits, seven hex chars. And so we expect it to get this because you can see that it should be this part. Is it six? Seven. Yeah, I hope so. We will see through the tests if we can pass it and what we need to do to pass it and then we can calculate it. But it says, okay, we wanted this, but we got null. So we, need, we have a function that's invoked in here this one, get short hash. And I will open it here for you. You can do your magic and fix the test. 
Oh, you want me to fix it? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Come on, Sebastian. You can do it. So it looks like this. And uh, first good rule of testing is that you fail first. But you don't fail in exception, you fail in the assertion. So we already are there because we can see the message from the should be that says that something is wrong. If we had a fail, that would be like this. Can you fit in here? OK. So we had like an operational error. Then this is, this is not a good, good fail for us because then something failed, and that's not what we are testing. What we are testing is that the should be is correct. So now we don't know if our test proves anything or if we have a bug in the test. What we want to see is a, a message like we had it before, or we just hard code some string. And we run it, and we get this message that says, yeah, we wanted this string, but we got another string, so they differ in here. You need to fix it to make it correct. Now it's your time to shine. So you have this incoming hash, and you need to make it just the first seven characters. Sent from this one. Yeah, and it's coming in here, because in here we are calling it, we are passing in the input value, and so here you just need to make it seven characters. So this one will be still with string. Uh-huh, yeah. So if I uh, just take the word on the string and just take the first seven. Yeah, exactly. Should I type it in? Yeah. Do you want to do it? OK. <laughs> so zero to seven, that's seven? OK, so that's it. Yeah. Let, let's try it out, because I don't think that works. So yeah, we got the correct amount of characters. But instead of returning a string, we got an array of cares. So we need to join it, right? Yeah, or you just can work just on the string and use the, instead of the square bracket, use the uh, something like dot remove and remove anything more than seven. Uh, OK, that would work as well. Let's just join it and be done with it. Oh, yeah, like substring. Yes. That would also work. And that's the good thing about testing. So this is the solution that I had in there before, before I deleted it. But if we implemented it as you suggested, so we would do hash substring, and it would be 0, 06, I hope. Oh, 7, sorry because the second one is the length, not the index. And we get the same result. And I actually did this when I was presenting this talk in, in uh, Poland at their PowerShell user group. And someone objected, OK, yeah, because someone came up with this exact solution with the substring. And somebody else was saying, yeah, that's great, but we don't like doing stuff in .NET when we can do them in PowerShell, PowerShell way. So for us, this is hard to understand, and we would rewrite it. And they can, because. We have two equivalent solutions, and we have the tests to prove that we are right in both cases. One of them might be slower, one of them might be faster, one of them might be more idiomatic or not. We don't care as long as it passes and uh, as it matches our uh, expectations and coding conventions. So thank you. How much time do we have? Still some minutes. 15 minutes. So let's. Let's blow through this. Um, which one is the second example? This one? Of course. So this is how we shorten the hash. If you looked at this function, this would be the scheme that you could use for it. So you have a function that's in the middle, and then you give it some input, and you take some output, and that's it. You have no side effects. Nothing else is happening whatsoever. And this is the easiest shape of function to test, because 
it's pure and you just give it inputs, you give it the expected output, and if that matches, your function is hopefully correct. We have another task which goes around the same idea. We have a name and we want to convert it into the Jenkins uh, environment variable format. So we have like this NuGet version and then we have capital letters, but in the middle we have underscore because a capital letter is here. So it indicates a new word. And so we want to make them all look alike. But the idea about, about the function is the same. We give it input, we get output. Anyone else wants to do some coding? Come on, guys. Yeah, come on. Come on up. So that's not it. Um, I said environment. It's basically the same as uh, command shell, right? Is it? Let's hope. Is that like a, like a brand of vehicle? <laughs> so here, here's the test for it. Um, we got ABC and we want this, but we got null. And we pushed in NuGet version. We wanted to get NuGet version, but again, we got null. And what you can also see in this example, not very well though, is test cases right there. So what we can do is we take one body of the test and we apply multiple inputs and outputs on it and validate against that, which is really good when you like discover edge cases. Like someone can, comes and says, okay, but if I now give it a null value, it throws an exception. So you want to fix it somehow. Or if I give it this uh, string that has two Vs, one after another, so we have like NuGet V, V version, then I don't want the underscore in the middle of that. So you just add it in here and you fix it in your code. You don't have to write a whole new test for it with just repeating this body. So it's a so-called data-driven tests, and it's really good for this. So do you understand what needs to happen? Not really. Oh yeah, so you're using, you're splitting camel case uh, with underscores. Of course. Uh, okay, awesome. I've done that before. Okay. Oh yeah, how do I use, um, I've never done regex with uh, case sensitivity. Is it like that in brackets I thing? I it's C, C, C match? Or oh, yeah, C, sorry. Yeah, C yeah, split? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. All, of the, all of the parameters are the same, but they start with C. Oh yeah, never mind. <laughs> sorry, I just did a lot of auto it recently, and I just, I'm all mixed up. Good. Yeah, all right. Or you can just tell it to me and I will type it down. I want to have, oh yeah, okay, never mind. That's not so bad. Uh, yeah, okay, and how do I get? You can you can brainstorm. You all know PowerShell. Oh yeah, 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 Or you can just use normal oh, split. Yeah, you split at regex. Yeah, of course. You can just split through the PowerShell operator. <laughs> ah, where are the keys? These are all crazy back. <laughs> it's just the English keyboard. No, I mean the or just key. tell me what you want to express, and I will oh, write yeah, so it down. Basically, all right. Well, we've got the A to Z, and then we're going to take the we're going to split name using the, but, yeah. but how do we split it using a case sensitive? Like that, so it will be C split. Yeah, but, oh, C split, oh, okay, C yeah, fine, yeah, yeah, and then that's, but then once we do that, we need to. But we need to get the le get letter back. Yeah, that's gonna be model objects, but then we're gonna, in for, we're basically gonna rejoin them, and when the delimiter is gonna be underscore. But if you split, then you split it on the letter, and you lose the letter. Oh, right, yeah. Okay, we only have 15 minutes. I will show you how yeah, I did please, it. Please do it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's always nice to like go against because then we just like do C split. We return it. I save it. it I run it. it. 
and I'm just like, okay, that doesn't doesn't even get where I want to be. So you see, like, it doesn't work. But you can try it out over and over again, and you can talk with your colleagues, and they will tell you, do it this way, do it that way. You run the test again, and then you see if you are onto it or not. So what I did is I do replace. Well, it's actually a C replace, I think. And then I replace every capital letter with an underscore and then itself. Oh, clever. Yeah. <laughs> but that still doesn't give me the answer. Why well, not? Because I have underscore in the start. Mm. So I need to trim it. Trim it at the start and the end. Yeah, it's just oh, enough to just trim start. Yeah, yeah, but I can trim both of them. Come on. And so now we get the correct answer, but it's not correct. Because um, if we output what we got, then if I do write host result, so we get it to the output because we are swallowing all this, all the other stuff. Save it and run it. Then you can see that we are actually getting NuGet version. Uh, where is it? Here it is. But it's not capitalized because there is a bug in my test, not a bug in my code. Isn't that what you wanted? No, because no. I want it capitalized. You, here's it says the. It converts NuGet version to all capital, right? Yeah, but here is the output. I, what I'm outputting from the test. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. oh, gotcha, gotcha. That, so the, the one that's in white is what the result is. Yeah, I see gotcha. what I mean. So if you look here, then I, I would do that. But first, I want to prove my test to be incorrect. So I need to say be exactly, which in our assertion language means compare it like case sensitively. So if I run it now, then we get an error, which pinpoints this, this problem. And I actually just noticed it by, by an accident when I was doing this presentation for the first time. But Sometimes you just get, do bugs in your code, and even if you have tests, it still can be buggy and still not do what you need. So I don't know if you saw this GIF, like you have two doors opening into each other, like two unit tests, zero integration tests, exactly this situation. So we should do two upper, or ideally two upper invariant, but I don't want to type that. And now it works. So thank you very much. That's all right. Wow. Stage fright. Stage fright, that's it. And again, same shape. Uh, data go in, data go out. But we highlighted that there might be an error in our, in our test. Even though we did everything correctly, we like, made it fail in the assertion and so on. Now we have another example composing uh, the version string. So I have all of those pieces, and I want to put them together. Here's the test that I have. And so two things are happening in here. We have uh, this expected date, but, or expected version, but you can see there is a date in it. But today it's not the year 2017. Today is the year 2018. And if I call get date, I will get a different time all the time. And so I need to stabilize get date somehow. And for that, I use mock to replace the functionality that get date would normally give me with the functionality that I want. And I know that uh, get date is producing a daytime object, so I just instantiate it through the new object commandlet. I could also do this differently. Sometimes people run into issues. They try to call the original commandlet inside of the mock which you can do, but it will just go cyclic and it will never terminate. But if you want to or need to do that, then you need to do get command and ask for a type commandlet or whatever, or function, whatever the original type of your command is, and then you execute it through the ampersand symbol, through the ampersand execution operator. And that way you can execute whatever commandlet you want. You just need to avoid this alias that we create for, for your function. Yeah, it will. That's, we would do two upper invariant, but uh, this one? Yeah. 
Uh, we provide all the parameters, so it should be fine, hopefully. Hopefully. So again, we got null. We wanted something different. I will just take this one where I deleted it and revert it because we don't have enough time to write it down. Oh, wrong thing. So I reverted this piece of code so we can get the test to pass. So this one we would write. It's just connecting the dots from the items that we already have. But notice that we are calling get date in here. And uh, we are giving it the date. And we also call git version in here, but that's fine. And uh, we stabilize the external dependency that we have. So if we didn't have mock, we couldn't test this because get date would always return different date and we could never say in the test what should happen. What we could do in the test is that we would uh, re-implement again the same functionality and then we could get them to match. But you don't want to do that most of the time unless you do property-based testing, but then that's a totally different story. So we can use mocks to stabilize external dependencies, and that's exactly what we did here. How much time do I still have? Good. Good, good. So again, if we look at the shape of this test, then we have a mock, we have a function, and then we have some output. So by using the mock, we stabilize something that uh, is either hard to define or hard to set up, or just dependent on some environment variables that we cannot control. And then we pipe it through our function and we get the expected output. And so I had all of this stuff in place and then I wanted to actually put them together and build a Docker image, tag it with the correct stuff and so on. And I wanted to test how that's happening. So I had to use mocks extensively because this is uh, bound to the environment a lot and it's using a lot of infrastructure. But Luckily, with mocks, I can add seams to test those different things independently of what's actually happening in the system. But at the same time, I'm also sacrificing the fidelity of the real system. So as we did before, if I replace get date with just a simple mock, then if I make a mistake in here, and instead of returning a date time object, I will just return a string, then the function that's in the system that will in the future be used in production with my system because in production I want to call the real get date, not the mocked one, will be different from what I'm doing in the mock. So the fidelity is different. It can produce different results from mock that you wouldn't encounter in production, but it helps me test it. So you have to like balance this, like how detached I want to be from my environment versus how much of a chance I want to have this actually working in production. Where are we? Here we are. So we have this new Docker image and we have a uh, few dependencies in there. We have get version, which is a function that we wrote before that builds the version. And we want to give it like a static string because it's our dependency. Then we have this build Docker image function that would in turn call the Docker CLI and build the actual image. And uh, this is like a guard mock. Uh, that's something that just prevents any call to the function from doing anything. You want to use it sometimes like you have a delete of a resource like, and you have uh, permissions to delete it. So you want to be really safe, like whatever I do, please don't call this function and don't delete the user from the active directory because I'm testing in production or whatever. <laughs> and then we have the actual worker mock where we give it a parameter filter. So if we call it with those parameters, it will log the call and then we can go back and check if we actually called the function. 
and that's what we are doing here. We're calling a new Docker image function, and inside of it, it should call this build Docker image with those parameters. And then we go back and we check the assert log, uh, the mock log, and uh, check if the call was actually done with the parameters that we wanted. And we specify it should be done once and only once. And here's the parameter filter to use. And so this is the implementation. We pass in the tag, we pass in the path. You can see that there is a little bit of a problem that I didn't pass the path. And that's only highlighting what's happening when you do mocks over stuff that you cannot otherwise test. So there is still some margin for error. So be, be uh, careful with mocks, but use them a lot. <laughs> New Docker image, revert it back to what we've been doing before. And so here we are calling the build Docker image with the path and the correct version that we got. And we try to call the tests and see if they fail or pass. Okay, so we got a pass because we called the function that we just wrote with the correct parameters and we didn't do anything else. So what we just did is that we verified some behavior because we believe that our function that calls the Docker CLI is correct, even though it's not, but we have no other way of testing it apart from doing actual integration tests where we actually give it some sources and actually build the image. But we don't want to do it in every unit test. We can have like 40 unit tests just built around this, verifying the small behavior that's above it. And then we can have like two integration tests that will make sure if we give you those two files and we call the image this way, we will in the end get an image that actually have those files in it. So we just do it for two tests, not 40, because they are disconnected. So this is the scheme. We have some data in. We have a mock on the other side and function that calls the mock. And then we need to call a cert mock call to verify that we actually call the mock to verify that the behavior actually happened. And something that not a lot of people mention is discovery test. And so I told you I have this Git version of utility that I can use on my Git repository to get the correct version that I will have and so on. And when I started with it, I had no idea how it works. So I knew I want some behavior from it, but it looked quite complex, had a quite uh, different behavior on a new repository and on repository that I already had. So I said, okay, how do I test that? How do I verify it does what I want? I write tests. So I wrote tests again, this utility, and just checked if I do this, does it do that? If I add a file in this and now I have stage changes, what version does it give it to me? And how can I configure it to do it this way? And so I, like a road test against someone else's utility to verify how it works. And when I'd done this work, I just kept it because if they change it, if they change the default settings that I didn't change myself and I get different behavior and something starts breaking, I can see it. I can just say, okay, against the previous version, it works. Against the new version, when I updated, the tests stopped passing. So there must be some functionality change. And you can do this against APIs, you can do it against whatever you want. It just helps you discover how the whole thing works and so on. And helps you stabilize an external dependency if you will be updating it in the future. So this is a icon of the Git version utility. So we just give some data, we get some data because we cannot mock it out because that would uh, defeat the whole purpose of this exercise. So summary. Um, there are just few shapes of tests that you can apply. And uh, if you start looking for them, you will definitely see them. So it's data in, data out, mock in, data out, data in, mock out, and verify with a certain mock called, and then maybe some stabilizing of external dependencies. Not more than that. Uh, mocks should be used cautiously, as I said. You can just abstract so much away from your environment that in the end you deploy it and it doesn't work at all which is not very nice. 
especially when you spend two months uh, uh, pursuing somebody to just write the test with you, do the whole TDD thing and so on, and then you deploy it and it just blows up and doesn't work at all. And most of all, just experiment and have fun with it because there is a big community around Pester and if you get in touch, definitely somebody will help you. A good place to go is uh, PowerShell Slack, the testing channel. You can talk there with me or all the other people being there. So yeah, enjoy. You can get the code on my GitHub. It should be very easy to find. And that's it. Do we have time for questions? No? Okay, sorry, I'm over. There are some stickers in the front if you want some. So feel free to pick them up.